Hi, Dave Olson from the Salem News, and uh, we're here with Jerry Paracella, who is um, the incumbent um, candidate for the uh, 6th Essex District, representing the city of Beverly. And um, why don't we get right to, the, right to the questions, maybe talk a little bit about um, the last two years and what you think the um, successes and, and maybe challenges in the legislature have been. Uh, specific to, to Beverly. Okay, sure. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, the last two years, I mean, I think challenges statewide and, and maybe uh, to Beverly as well, you know, the, the opioid crisis is something I think has touched upon everybody's lives. Somebody knows uh, who's been touched upon that. So in, in the legislature, we've done a lot of work on the opioid issue, put a lot more money into having beds available. That seems to have been an issue that a lot of folks have been having trouble with is trying to find a bed. In Massachusetts, we only required three days of treatment, but we've pushed it up to 14 days where insurers have to cover 14 days of treatment. Massachusetts was the leader in requiring uh, doctors to only prescribe for seven days for mm -hmm. opioids, so you don't have like a 30-day supply in the medic medicine cabinet. Mm -hmm. We found that that tended to be a problem where there was like Oxycontin lying around mm -hmm. in the house and you might have teenagers or others who uh, have access to that and that can lead to the addiction and you know to heroin and things like that. So uh, that's been a big issue as far as specific things with, Mass with Beverly, you know, just trying to bring home the resources uh, of state money to Beverly for projects that are important to Beverly, like the new middle school that just opened up this year, $50 million, state funds for that, $20 million for the Route 1A project, the Brimble Ave project, $5 million, got $200,000 in the budget this year for the city to help design the new police station. Mm -hmm money for the carriage house, so things like that, you know, Chapter 70 money, which is money for the schools, mm -hmm. about $8 million for Beverly, about $5.5 million for Beverly for things like the parks, paying for police and fire, the unrestricted local aid, and, you know, money for roads. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about, you know, potholes <laughs> and sidewalks and yep. stuff like that. So uh, a couple million dollars for that that came back to Beverly. So uh, trying to make sure that we tackle those local issues, but also those broad issues like the opi opioid mm -hmm. issue. Yeah, and I think that that's interesting you, you make that one of your, your top issues. It's because it seems like um, one, of the, one of the heartening things about, especially in Massachusetts, is everybody seems to agree that there's a problem and everybody's working um, very hard across the aisle to solve, to solve the problem. But at the same time, it, 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 it can be frustrating. It seems um, opioid deaths are down um, because, you know, the naloxone is, is readily available. Narcan is available for people. But the number of overdoses don't seem to be budging that much. And um, fentanyl is still, is, a, is, a, is um, the synthetic opioid is an incredibly um, dangerous product. And it seems like Massachusetts itself is having a really difficult time with that. What can we do, you know, in the next session to kind of take take uh, take a whack at that? Yeah, no question. I mean, you know, we did get some state funding for the police and fire to have Narcan because you mentioned it's so expensive too. You know, so there were two twenty thousand dollar grants. Um, I think the you know one of the things that we're really looking hard at is you know when someone shows up at the emergency room, what do you do? I mm -hmm. mean, a lot of times they were just released back into the community. Now we're trying to develop wraparound services so mm -hmm. that the folks aren't just literally, okay, you brought back to life, you're treated at the ER, and you're back on the street. Um, there's been talk about having peer support specialists at the hospital that that you know have been through this themselves and are now can support uh, folks. Um, there's been talk about maybe having a hold at the hospital mm -hmm. so they don't just get released right away. You know, they can have counseling and things like that. That's, that's a challenging one because are you violating their civil rights, right, their adults? Right. Should they be, you know, if they want to leave, you know, should we? So that, right. that's, that's a challenge. But that's, that's some of the things that we're really looking hard at for the next session. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I think it's critical. I mean, it's you, like you said, the deaths are down, but I've talked to police and fire who say they've narcaned folks more than once on the same day. Right, right. It's terrible. Right, right. And, exactly. and, 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 and I think Beverly is doing a good job. We've brought Dr. Poti, who's an, mm -hmm. an expert from uh, the Berkshires, to come and speak to the students at, at the high school and at the middle school. And she's talked to parents so that mm -hmm. we as parents can sort of understand what's going on with our kids and other issues that, that we can uh, be more familiar with. So uh, those kind of things, education, mm -hmm. um, educating doctors, educating teachers, educating parents, you know, that kind of stuff is really important. We've put money into the state budget to do that. Right. 
right? And you have and you have the um, the high school, the consortium right up right up the street, which really seems to be a um, leader in a lot in a lot of ways. Um, do you feel? I mean, a lot of times with the legislature, there'll be a big um, push, and you know you'll make you have a big um, issue, and and you'll pass legislation on, it, and then it might be five or ten years before it comes up again. Do you think this is an issue that that is almost a yearly? Um, topic? You know, I, it's, I don't think it's something that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. You know, like you mentioned, fentanyl, and there's also car yeah. fentanyl, which yeah. is sort of a derivative of that. I mean, they were, we, it was weird. They weren't illegal for distribution uh, in Massachusetts, so we, we changed that. We corrected that. Unfortunately, uh, the folks that are doing this stuff are pretty uh, adept at, you know, changing the formulas and things like that. Um, so it's hard to keep up sometimes, but um, what we did do was um, essentially we said we're going to follow the federal schedule of illegal drugs so we don't have to keep passing legislation. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. the feds say, hey, this is illegal, then Massachusetts will follow that now. So we don't have to just keep trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, so dealers that are dealing fentanyl, car fentanyl, you know, they're going to face severe penalties. Right. Does it still stop them? Yeah, you know, I don't know. But I mean, if they're doing it, we need to make sure that they're properly mm -hmm. penalized. And, and kind of a, a a similar issue a little bit are you are you comfortable with how the um the legalization and the and the sale of marijuana has been has been rolled out by the state and in, in the in the communities i mean personally i wasn't thrilled about it about it being i mean i have a 14 year old so what kind of message are we sending but now that it's legalized and the voters have spoken you know we need to make sure that we get it right it has taken longer than than people want but the way I sort of look at it is, let's get it right when we do it. Mm -hmm. um, let's make sure that the labs are out there, that they can test it. Um, you know, we've got, we're pretty strict. I mean, Colorado and Oregon and other states did it before us, so we could sort of look at them, what they did right, what they did wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually met with a group um, the other day that's looking to uh, provide uh, mar recreational mm -hmm. marijuana in, in Beverly. Mm -hmm. So I wanted mm -hmm. to talk to them, what's your plan? What are right. you guys doing? Right. What's your security? They're very sophisticated now. They've been in business for a while. So, um, you know, I think it should get going, I think, fairly soon. You know, the state has sort of stepped up, this right. Cannabis Control Commission. And, um, you know, let's get it right, and let's make sure that when folks are buying this stuff, that it's, you know, it says what it is, you know. <laughs> right. right. Especially with those edibles and the candy, and you had, like, Things that look like Kit Kats right. and Reese's and stuff that they were trying to sell. So that stuff is all a lot in Massachusetts. Right. It's one of those issues I think is going to be need to be a lot of um, education of the public when when these things do open, so you consumers are are um, aware of what it is of what it is they're buying. Do you think? I mean, what do you think about Beverly's approach? Some communities, you know, they try and they've tried to almost I think um, regulate it to a point where it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. To um, to have a, a marijuana shop in town, regardless of how of how the their citizens might have voted. I mean, Beverly seems to to be somewhere between Salem and, and Peabody in the in the the scheme of things on that. Yeah, I mean, Beverly by, under the law, Beverly can have up to four. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I think the city officials are taking a deliberate approach, making sure it's done right. But um, ultimately, at the end of the day. There has to be a community host agreement, so they have to come to an agreement with the mayor, whether mm -hmm. it's how much they're going to pay, you know, what's the security like, and things like that. So there is still that that local control, but you know, the voters in Beverly did approve it. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I think the reality is it's going to come <laughs> to Beverly. And some of those community host arrangements in other towns have been almost extortionate in what <laughs> people are, are asking are asking for. Um, another another issue, you know, it's been it's been in the news lately is um, affordable housing. Of course, I mean, I think I think Beverly, um, as a as a community, has been fairly um, progressive and, and open in in um, finding finding a place for all sorts of affordable housing. You know, now and in the future with the the Sawyer Road and and Toza Road project with Harbor Light, um, and then down the road you might see uh, Hamilton, where the it's just a battle to get to get anything mm -hmm. built there. And you know, is there a concern that? Um, Cities like Beverly and Salem are, are taking on um, a disproportionate load of, of the region's um, affordable housing um, stock. Yeah, it does seem unfortunate that our neighbors, you know, are not as receptive. I mean, like you mentioned, so Beverly, I mean, for example, we've got 
at the Pleasant Street Apartments, which uh, house homeless veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the River House, which uh, is a homeless shelter. Uh, you know, we've got the local zoning ordinance that requires 12% of mm -hmm. multifamily projects to be affordable. Um, so I think Beverly is much more accommodating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just the overall issue of affordable housing, you know, what is affordable? <laughs> Even like some of the units, um, with that new project that's being built right next to the depot, mm -hmm. um, there's 16 units of affordable housing there. And even there, the affordable units range from like sixteen hundred a month to like you know nineteen hundred a month, and <laughs> right. that's affordable. Right. So right. I mean, it can be tough for a teacher, uh, you know, someone who lives and works in Beverly to live in Beverly. Right. So right. it's a challenge, no right. question about it. We did do a pretty significant uh, bond bill at the state level, uh, over a billion and a half dollars to subsidize affordable housing projects throughout the state. It should fund about ten thousand units of affordable housing. So. We're hoping that will have some sort of a dent. It's mm -hmm. just, it is, it is tough in the Northeast. Uh, we're such, you know, we're, there's a, we're crowded. Uh, there's no, we're not, as they say, <laughs> they're not create new land. Right. So, uh, you know, to try to do that challenge. And I think for Beverly, it's sort of a mixed bag because Beverly is doing so well and people want to live here mm -hmm. that it does create that issue of can you afford to live here? Right. And, in, and for folks that, that work in Boston, hey, you can just hop on the train and, you're, mm -hmm. you're, and you're, you don't have to drive to your job in Boston. So there's a lot of good things about Beverly, but it also does re result in uh, having those challenges of creating affordable housing. Right. And I, I think there was, there was a um, legislation that had been proposed. I don't think it made it through um, to um, rework some of the zoning laws to, give, to, to make it easier um, statewide to, to build affordable because Because trying to... As Andrew Franz will probably tell you, trying to trying to build an affordable um, housing project, it's, it can be a real like thicket of, of you know lead, of lawsuits and zoning and zoning board of appeals. And um, is there any hope that that, that kind of um, effort will will um, restart next year? Zoning is <laughs> it's so complicated. Before I became a rep, I, I, as a lawyer, I did a lot of zoning work, and, and it is it is complicated. And you know, folks in, in every community has their own unique zoning. So I think the challenge is, do you do you have the state saying to the communities, this is how you need to do it? Then you get the pushback from the community saying, state, don't tell us what what, what right. we should be doing. So that's where I think it got stalled. Is trying to balance that of creating affordable housing, not having it be so burdensome, um, but also ha having some local control. And, and that's where I think you'd get a lot of pushback from some of the community saying, hey, you're telling us what to do and you shouldn't be telling us. So that's why I think we can sometimes, I think it's a, it's a challenge and I think it's something that we're going to look at for sure. It's just trying to balance the local control with having you know this sort of policy at the state level saying, let's make it a little bit easier. Like, like when um, when Fort Devens closed, they we created um, they created their own sort of entity there and their own permitting, and it really worked out well. And that place is booming now. There's mm -hmm. a lot of commercial business there, um, so I think it works okay for the commercial segment. The question is, in that sort of like its own enclave, and there's not a lot of uh, homes around there, and so I think. I even talked to uh, the folks at Devons about that, saying, is there any way to replicate that locally? So I think that's something that we'd like to try to look at. The question, like I said, is just trying to not have so much state <laughs> control right. that you lose right. that local aspect and input from right. it. Especially when you have 351 cities and towns ranging from a place like Beverly to a place like Hamilton. It's got to be... Um, Difficult. And Western Mass is so different than mm -hmm. the North. I mean, it almost feels like a different state in a way. Um, and so... You know, those reps are saying, hey, you're telling, tell, trying to tell us what to do in Boston, and we're it just doesn't fit mm -hmm. with what's going on in Greenfield or Pittsfield or Holyoke and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's a challenge. And, and in the meantime, in Beverly, you have, you have uh, Brimble, which is, which is becoming, you know, a real um, center for, for a lot of um, apartment, like the, for lack of a better, in Beverly, in Beverly scheme of things, high-rise apartments with a, with a lot of... Um, um, it's kind of changing the the character uh, of that of that stretch of, of Beverly. What's your what's your you I mean, mean Rantoul? Rantoul, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I have Brimble yeah. on the brain. I got to go back to work after this. Yeah, Rantoul, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a few years ago, Beverly changed the zoning to allow 70 feet, so uh, that has a result in that. I, I think it's sort of that they call it the transit oriented development, where mm -hmm. you know you just walk out of your apartment right. and you walk to the train station. Um, 
I do hear from folks saying, oh, geez, Wendover is taking over the city, you know, what's going on there? Um, but, you know, I think they do quality work, and, you know, the housing is needed in Beverly, so that is a, it is a challenge, you know, how do we balance, you know, not having so much traffic, you know, like on mm -hmm. Rantoul and, and mm -hmm. things like that, but also uh, meeting the housing needs of the residents. But I think... Um, with a lot of those folks, they do work in Boston, so they say, hey, you know, I'm hopping on the commuter mm -hmm. rail, so, you know, I'm not sure if it's creating the huge traffic issues. I mean, I, I definitely think there has been about <laughs> it, but hopefully you're getting those folks that don't have to drive in their car. They're just walking down right. and, and hopping right. on the train. It's a good, that's a good segue to, the, you know, M the MBTA. I mean, that's been a constant issue. I mean, I'm sure Governor Baker would like people to stop talking <laughs> about the MBTA for a while. But, what, you know, what's your, it seems like there's been progress and fits and starts with with um, things like reliability and and um, overall service I mean what's your what's your sense of of how the how the commuter rail has, has gone? yeah I mean in 2015 during that snowmageddon I mean <laughs> I don't think I don't think I ever got more emails from folks and calls about you know the people want a reliable service and it was terrible then um, they have put a lot of money into it we did make changes to uh, allow the governor to have a little more flexibility in the Pacheco mm -hmm. law mm -hmm. and also um, create that fiscal control management, fiscal management control board. I haven't gotten hardly any calls in like I would say the last like three to four months from folks about the train. So I think the reliability <laughs> has improved uh, mm -hmm. significantly. You know, when winter comes, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> right, that'll be the but, test. Um, they have made progress. The thing that really annoyed me, and I sort of harped on this with a T for a long time, was they did a lousy job collecting fares. So mm -hmm. people who put the money for their monthly passes, mm -hmm. seeing other people walking on the train and never having their fares collected, yeah. that wasn't fair. They're doing a lot better job at that. Now they stop everybody at North Station mm -hmm. and make sure they have a ticket. Um, and they were sort of poo-pooing that, you know, like six, eight years ago, saying, oh, that's hardly anybody. And then they did a study and found it at about $20 million. <laughs> right, so it's not, right, it's real money. Right, right. Um, so, you know, I'm glad they're cracking down on that, mm -hmm. you know. So there have been improvements. I think there's still a long way to go. The T is the oldest transit system in the United mm -hmm. States. So there's a lot of old switches and gears and things that people don't think about that, that they're updating now. So hopefully mm -hmm. that will improve reliability. Were you surprised that the governor didn't try to extend the waiver on the, on the Pacheco? Yeah, he never really, he didn't bring it up this time. You know, the three years is up, but those contracts are still in place. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's why he wants to kind of let it play out. I think he's trying to work with the Carmen's Union, which is the biggest T union. Um, they had some concessions in their last contract, probably because of uh, mm -hmm. the pressure of you know competing in the Pacheco law. So I think it's sort of a hey, let's see how this plays out, and if we need to address it again, we mm -hmm. will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I know you've you're you're a, a veteran. Um, I know you've made you've made that that's been one of your major your major. Um, um, topics in, in, in the legislature. Maybe give us a little bit of an update on, on what you've done over the past, you know, I think it was all four, all four sessions. Yeah, so I became chairman of the Veterans Commission la Committee last session, mm -hmm. so we did this huge bill called the HOME Act, and it was really, really comprehensive. I took all, all, bills, all the bills that were filed, looked at them, and we sort of made this comprehensive bill. Some of the highlights are in Massachusetts now, if you're a veteran, that's actually a protected class, just like race, religion, mm -hmm. gender, identity, things like that. Because we we were hearing from folks saying, oh, geez, this guy's a veteran. Does he have PTSD? Should we mm -hmm. hire this person? You know, things like that. So now that's a protected class. In, in Massachusetts, if you were a 100% disabled veteran, your income from the VA actually disqualified you from public housing. It was really odd, just the way the formula they used. Mm -hmm. So you're disabled, you can't work, you served your country, you had serious injuries, and you couldn't qualify for public housing. It made no sense. So we changed the formula to eliminate that so that that disability income would not be counted mm -hmm. against you for public mm -hmm. housing. We created... Uh, in public housing now, veterans have uh, preferred status. So if it's all equal and you're a veteran, then you get a preference. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the highlights that we did in that bill. In Massachusetts, if you're a veteran and you deploy to Iraq or Afghanistan or a place like that, you have when you come home, you get a $1,000 mm -hmm. welcome home bonus. Mm -hmm. We're the only state that does that. So I've traveled around to a lot of other states, whether it's because of my military duty or you know as chairman of the Veterans Committee, and they're amazed at some of the... Uh, services that we provide veterans in Massachusetts. 
for example, we have our own Department of Veteran Service, and we have what's called the SAVE team. These guys are on call 24-7. I got a call from a woman about a year ago. She said, my son is having a lot of problems. He's a veteran. I'm worried about him harming himself. I called the SAVE team, and within two hours, they were at the house. They were looking into it. They were finding this uh, veteran with services. So that's state Pacific to Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. That's not a VA um, service that's mm -hmm. uh, the SAVE team in Massachusetts. So, like you said, in Massachusetts, we really step up to support our veterans. Mm -hmm. What what um, what still needs to be done? I mean, it, it's this is the longest war in American history, which is which is stunning when you stop and think about it. Um, with no, unfortunately, no no real end in sight. I mean, what is the next what is the next area where 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 veterans need help? I think. You know, that, that stigma of PTSD, I think it's starting to, to go away, but, you know, that's something that you know, we want to make sure that if, if you know, don't be afraid to talk to your, your colleagues about that. Don't be afraid to say that you need help. Um, we'll be there for you, and you won't be stigmatized. You won't uh, face discrimination because of it. Um, you know, so I think that's important. There was a, an issue with veterans homelessness, but mm -hmm. that's really been tackled the last couple of years. Boston said that they've got eliminated homelessness in Boston for veterans. Um, so those kind of things. But I think the challenge for, for Massachusetts specifically is someone like myself or National Guardsmen, we deploy, we come back, and there's not that big military base mm -hmm. like in Texas mm -hmm. or Virginia mm -hmm. or North Carolina. So you're sort of on your own. So how do we make sure that when they come back, that we can reach out to them and get them the services that they need, mm -hmm. because you're just sort of thrown back into the yeah, community. There's not like a clearing area. There's not like yeah. A, yeah, yeah. There's no. There's no like if you're if you're an active duty soldier, you come back to your unit, you come back to your base. There's all these uh, services mm -hmm. on the base to help you. You just get thrown back. You know, I just came back to Beverly. That was it. I deployed <laughs> to Iraq. I get done, and I'm back to Beverly. And also, my life is supposed to be normal. Mm -hmm. You know, so that can be a challenge, and so. A lot of out, outreach from the state level, like with that save team I talked about, um, having um, a whole bunch of different veterans um, meetings. They're having coffees now, like the Vittorio Rocky mm -hmm. Post every Saturday, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like that, so that we can reach out and touch those veterans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, turning a little bit, I mean, the Massachusetts economy is doing is doing fantastic now. There's, you know, employment is is unemployment is like three. 0.5 percent or something like that. Um, with the economy going so well, you know, schools, you know, have have received you know a bump in in school funding, but a lot of them will say it hasn't been necessarily commensurate with how great the economy is doing. Uh, how do you feel? Uh, and, and also, a lot of people will talk about the school funding formula being um, horribly outdated. Um, what's your what's your thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, there's there was a commission that looked at that. They made recommendations. Um, we did pass, unfortunately, like the House and the Senate passed two versions really late in the session. We couldn't get them to, to reconcile, so we're going to take a tackle at, tackle that again next session. The House version would have given uh, cities and towns an extra $500 million in education funding beyond the $4.9 mm -hmm. that we did this year. So I think that will happen next session. We'll have more time to tackle that. It's so complicated. I mean... So when, let's say, for example, we increase the uh, education funding by $100 million statewide. Right, That's big right, money, right? right? But Beverly, that might be $50,000 right, because right. you're spreading over 351 cities and towns. So that's the challenge is how do you do that? And places like Brockton and Springfield say, hey, we're not getting the money that we deserve. So trying to make it fair. You know, Beverly, we get about eight million. Salem, right next door, gets about nineteen million. It's, right. it's all based on you know demographics, population, Pro income, property, yeah. things like property. Yeah. So it, it's really, really complicated. It's like an MIT <laughs> and <laughs> right. math whiz is right. trying to figure this stuff out. But right. I think there is a recognition that we do have to tackle that. I think the issues that I hear about are special ed costs for sure. Mm -hmm. Those are a challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm told, like, by Dr. Hershey, the superintendent, is you could get one student that moves into Beverly, and it could cost them $200,000 mm -hmm. if they have special needs. How do you say no to that kid and right. that family? You, you, right. you, we shouldn't, but, you know, that, that that's unexpected costs yep. that, that they're dealing with. So 
in Massachusetts, we're supposed to reimburse the cities and towns 75 percent. We were at like 68 percent a couple of years ago. We're up to like 71 percent now. So if we can try to get up to that 75 yeah. percent, I think that'll help the cities yeah. and towns as well. Yeah. Great. We have a few more minutes. Um, there are also three ballot questions, um, three questions on the ballot in November. Um, there's one, question one is about the, uh, the nursing staffing ratios. Question two um, would, would create a commission to, to consider Citizens United. And question three is the um, um, transgender bill. What, what, what's your, how would you vote on, how are you planning on voting on those? I'm going to tell, I'll talk on the last two because those are the two easier ones for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the commission is easy. It's, it's just a commission looking at the Citizens United mm -hmm. case. That's, 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 that's a huge issue, you know, whether or not we should have corporations mm -hmm. funding elections and things like that. Um, so yes on that. Um, question three, the transgender bill, I voted for that as, mm -hmm. a, as a state rep, so I don't think we should go back, mm -hmm. take a step back. I mean, that was an odd situation where at the time, it was illegal to discriminate hiring a transgender person, but the, let's say that person worked at a restaurant. We could say you can work here, but you can't use the bathroom. It made no sense. So um, we made public accommodation part of that, so I'll vote yes on that. The nursing question, I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> that is a challenge. My brother's a nurse. You know, He's telling me, Jerry, vote yes. Then you've got um, like the State Health Policy Commission, which is an independent agency saying it could cost the state $900 million right. a year. Right. That's a huge hit. So I, I don't know. I guess I'm leaning no on that mm -hmm. one. I mean, I think there's just the implications of that, I think, are, are not clear to folks. You know, mm -hmm. so. Does, does, it, does doing things by doing that stuff by ballot, does that give you pause a little bit? I mean, it's taking, I mean, it's, you know, theoretically it's the legislature's job. Um, I, think, I think with something complicated like mm -hmm. that, it should be done in the legislative process with hearings. We did vote a couple of years ago to require uh, hospitals to have only two patients per one nurse in the ICU, mm -hmm. which is the most critical patients. And that was sort of an agreement among all the parties. And yeah, that makes sense. We'll mm -hmm. do that. Nobody could come to an agreement on this nurse staffing question, so um, the Mass Nurse Association came up with this ballot question, and I don't think it's the best way to to legislate. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's how the marijuana question came about. Right. And it right. was written by the marijuana industry. Right. So right. I mean, <laughs> here we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, getting going to to the to the statewide race. Um, you know, um, Governor Governor Baker seems to be. Um, over the past four years, be very popular not only among among Republicans, but he seems to have worked very well um, with Democrats too. I was wondering how you would grade his performance over over the past you know four years, and where has he done well, and where would he need to improve? You know, I think we what, what I like about the legislature and just in politics in Massachusetts, we do work well together. I mean, a lot of times, like the budget is the most important thing, and we'll vote it like one fifty nine. There's one hundred and sixty of us. It might be one fifty nine to one, one fifty eight to two. So I think, as far as working with the governor, you know, I think we've had a good working relationship with him. I, I you know, I, he signed the veterans bill that I talked about, mm -hmm. the Pete Frady's bill mm -hmm. that I uh, introduced. Uh, he's coming to Beverly a bunch of times, and the lieutenant governor. So, I mean, I think we have had a good working relationship with them. I mean, there's obviously, you know, I think that issues that you talked about earlier, like the transportation, mm -hmm. is probably his Achilles heel in a way, but I mean, he's, he is trying to tackle and address it. So I have a good working relationship with the governor and his staff. Um, I think he's a pretty popular guy, and I think he tries mm -hmm. to keep politics out of a lot mm -hmm. of the decisions. And you're a Democrat, makes. so yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how so, would you, how would you, how would you, um, you know, assess the legislature's job or how they've done over the last. Is there anything? Is there anything big that was left on the table that you wish um, hadn't been? I think healthcare costs are a huge problem for our budget. It's 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 like forty two percent of the state budget, and there was a bill to try to address that, and it never made it through the finish line. It's it's very complicated. So I think that's something that we're really going to have to try to tackle because if we don't. We have a billion dollar surplus this year, but a lot of it gets chewed up by the mm -hmm. increased costs in health care, so you can't provide that extra money for transportation or education that you'd like to if it's all getting chewed up by these mandated health care costs, mm -hmm. you know, Medicaid and things like that. So I think that's something that we really need to tackle. And in that special ed that we talked about and the right. funding formula, I think those are things that we're going to 
really try to tackle hard next session if I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the Brimble overpass, where are we? <laughs> everybody, everybody on Dunham Road is waiting to see when the Brimble overpass is going to. Yeah, phase two. I yeah. mean, that's, you know, I, I, you know, that was a few years. Back when Mayor Scanlon was mayor, that was a $20 million project. Right. Who knows how much it is now? <laughs> I'd love to see that happen and take a lot of that traffic off of Brimble Ave. Um, but that's something that, you know, we need to work with. Once people learn to use yeah. the roundabouts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Exactly. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. I and appreciate we're it. we're all set.